Okay. All right. I am hoping, assuming you can see my slides. I'm going to get started here. So what has filled our fields of vision over the past few months? Probably far more of our apartments and refrigerators and housemates than we would have preferred. Certainly more than enough Zoom grids and email interfaces to, to last a lifetime. And those incessantly glowing screens have also delivered some pervasive visualizations of phenomena that most of us can't really process empirically firsthand. We've encountered images of mask wearing grocery store workers, medical teams donning jury rigged uh, personal protective equipment, elected officials press conference PowerPoints, and the faces of those lost to COVID-19, a disproportionate number of which are faces of color. Black faces in particular have also lent themselves to alternative captioning. We've seen on our screens faces of folks who continue to suffer and die at the hands of the police, as well as the multi-hued and massive protests that have arisen to demand justice. More recently, our screens have per perversely materialized Cecilia Ticci's and Lynn Spiegel's metaphors likening the television to a digital hearth as our laptops and smartphones have burned orange, channeling the wildfires on the West Coast. And juxtaposed with so many of these arresting images has been a set of cool abstractions that aim to impose a sense of perverse order on so much chaos and tragedy. The heat map shows us appropriately sites of conflagration where the wildfires and the virus are spreading, where lives have been taken by those charged with their protection. It's of course no coincidence that those same hotbeds of police brutality are also fomenting grounds for protest. Similarly, the curve has been deployed variously to refer to, sorry, that is to reflect the number of COVID-19 cases, deaths, or hospital beds, the number of acres burned, the number of lives lost, and dollars spent on police budgets. These curves not only represent, at some critical remove, our current realities, they also shape our material futures. As Holly Jean Buck notes, the curve, quote, can provide a frame, an instruction set, a kind of prescription for what governance is needed, end quote. This is, of course, presuming that what the grid purports to show is recognized as a matter of concern by government leaders who commonly counter with their own grids, their own data, demonstrating that the ostensible objectivity of visualization serves instead as a rationalization of ideology. Whatever curve is prioritized, it can then, Buck says, provide a frame, an instruction set, a kind of prescription for what governance is needed, as I realize I'm repeating myself, Policy is then set out in order to bring reality in conformance with the curve. The representation sets events into motion along the Y axis, which points toward the future. Those X and Y axes form a grid, not unlike the gridded spreadsheets where much of the data constituting these visualizations were originally collated. We see that grid again inscribed on a material landscape. The satellite imagery tracing the wildfires, the geographic information systems tracking police data and crime statistics, and the land use maps and urban plans where the coronavirus takes its toll. In what follows, I'll examine how these data-driven modes of crisis communication index in the Persian sense, how they map onto or don't map onto the material terrains they purport to represent. How do these visual renderings capture the phenomenology of the crisis? And that, I should say crises, plural. How can graphs and grids crystallize the multi-sensory experience of place, of pain, fear, anger, exhaustion, frustration, loss, and devastation, as well as joy and wonder that individual sensing subjects, communities, cities, and entire ecosystems experience on the ground in lives lived both within and beyond the grid? And how might we learn to look, listen, smell, taste, and grasp other forms of incidental ambient data in our urban environments? These alternative data sets can offer other ways of knowing and planning a city that exceeds the curve. Just a quick note, footnote, uh, this talk is an extension of an article I recently published with two graduate students, Emily Bowe and Aaron Simmons. In this piece, we examined critical mappings and data visualizations of COVID-19, and it's available open access on uh, Big Data and Society. So given the topic of this afternoon's event, I'll focus specifically on the COVID-19 pandemic. But we have to remember that this issue is not unrelated to police brutality or racial, socioeconomic, and environmental injustice. It's not divorced from practices and policies that pertain to policing and climate change. We find such social inequities reflected in the pertinent data sets themselves, which often fail to capture the experiences of many marginalized populations. I also want to offer a caveat. 
So what follows is a series of observations. It's a talk I wrote just for today, rather than a rehearsed argument. I'm merely sharing a collection of phenomenological resonances or synesthetic and, um, and analogs in the hope that it sparks a conversation. So let's think first about the visual rhetorics of these graphs and maps have manifested as a spatial logic. Consider the cars lined up at a food bank, the disciplined file of bodies and carts standing behind tape lines or on adhesive dots at the grocery store or cafe store or cafe pickup window, the proliferation of stanchions and thermal checkpoints that orchestrate our entry to the office or classroom. Suddenly, everyone's a Q theorist. No, not that kind of Q, although some knowledge about conspiratorial epistemologies would be useful in making sense of this whole situation too. Evolving social distancing signage and hand washing tutorials represent attempts to translate epidemiological research findings into publicly intelligible action items. Sparsely populated sidewalks and diminished road traffic, desolate airports and train stations likewise manifest the effects of those public health recommendations. Instead of being out and about, people stayed home, as was evidenced by the number of illuminated windows we saw in high rises across the world's cities, and as was evidenced in increased domestic electricity and internet usage. Breakdowns and shifts in global supply chains and local economies were manifested in empty grocery store shelves and ubiquitous Amazon hand carts and lobbies piled high with cardboard boxes. The logics of these cross-scalar political economic forces also revealed themselves in spreadsheets coordinating local mutual aid efforts to crowdsource PPE for medical workers, and at the same time, in those heart-wrenching handmade signs that populated many shop and restaurant windows, wherein family proprietors thanked their neighborhood customers for years of patronage and then bid them adieu. Such bespoke vernacular forms subverted the visual logic of the graph, in part because they're more about affect than rationality or market logics. They're actually even done in by market logics. The mask presents an interesting case. Here we have an apparatus that billions of people around the world were persuaded, not everybody of course, but billions around the world persuaded through both data-driven logos appeals and fear-driven pathos appeals to spontaneously adopt and incorporate into their wardrobes a commodity that spawned entirely new product lines and cottage industries within the space of a couple weeks. Yet the mask also threatened to stymie facial recognition technologies that could aid with contact tracing and the enforcement of social distancing. So facial recognition is now adapting to focus on the non-masked parts of the face, specifically the area around the eyes. Masks constitute in a robust and evolving pockets of sartorial culture, generating their own new markets that will undoubtedly be tracked and optimized and subjected to speculation. But they also incidentally lend themselves to another mode of tracing. The abandoned or discarded mask, ubiquitous on city streets, serves as, our carve, or sorry, serves as an archival trace of this traumatic moment. And I've been documenting just on my phone kind of the masks I come across in my walks each day. They're likely to be traced as well as a new major pollutant in our waste streams. I'll mention one more humble anecdotal example of how quarantine, a data-driven disciplined mode of existence, ideally, incited uh, resisted forms of visual culture. The monotonous visual universe of our homes led many in search of stimuli elsewhere. Hence, a profusion of social media posts documenting the glorious colors of spring botanicals, I imagine a scrape and an AI processing of Instagram and Twitter content could tell us if these platforms were any more floral and colorful between March and August of this year than they were in previous years. Yet again, anecdotally, I do know that these platforms served as a hub for the organization of crowdsourced herbaria and plant-based programming, a longing for the outside, essentially. Now, what about pandemic sounds and sonic data? I won't say much about this because Jocelyn has already attuned us to pandemic listening and Dietmar spoke about it as well. And I did publish a piece in April about the soundscape of quarantine and its relationship to various human and machinic modes of listening, including the uses and misuses of machine listening in public health diagnostics and crime detection and structural engineering and seismology and ecological conservation. We could talk more about this and I imagine we will given the resonances with, jo with um, Jocelyn's talk in the Q&A. So among all the senses, there's comparatively little research on smell and taste that is in the humanities and social sciences. But these registers were central to pandemic phenomenology. Their diminishment is one of the symptoms and potentially one of the long-term effects of COVID-19. Furthermore, one of our primary defenses, the mask, 
changed the way we experienced the city as an olfactory and gustatory realm. That cloth or paper barrier trapped our noses and mouths in a sterile, sterile, scare quote, envelope, even as some of us headed outdoors into our parks amidst budding trees and blooming flowers as the weather warmed. The pandemic has also reminded us that parks, as is not new to novel to any of you, are a vital matter of social and environmental justice. And perhaps in planning these post, the post-pandemic city, we should make a point of designing for olfaction too. The closure of restaurants meant that we ate more at home, which likely narrowed our fields of flavors. Yet we simultaneously scented our homes with a new clinical potpourri, including lots of bleach and hand sanitizer. Essential workers compelled to leave their homes in order to keep the subways running and the market online, including again, many people of color, were meanwhile subjected to the pungent aromas and toxic effects of powerful disinfectants. Smell and respiration are of course pivotal in the season's concurrent crises and uprisings. Just think of the smoke choking so many communities on the West Coast. Those people of color who lost their lives because they couldn't breathe. And also the protesters revolting against these victims' wrongful deaths, who likewise face suffocating fogs of tear gas and pepper spray. Finally, touch, which I'll link together with proxemics, which focuses on the proximity between people and things in their environments. Even Harry Styles, not someone I typically look to for wisdom or inspiration, recognizes that our tactile faculties, vital means of affective data gathering and communication, have been hampered in recent months. If you look to many of the canonical images of quarantine, from empty subways and streets to crowded hospitals and prisons and informal settlements and political rallies, we can haptically and affectively sense their distance or proximity. They visceralize statistics about the virus's aerosol spread and its longevity on various surfaces, as well as how those data are related to declining subway ridership and campus reopening plans, which dictate that our children sit alone, together in transparent bubbles, isolation bubbles, or gather in private schooling pods. We empirically experience those cautionary data when we're forced to turn a doorknob or press a touch screen at the grocery store, or when we interact with the teacher or corner store cashier through a plexiglass barrier. We feel a new self-consciously luxurious spaciousness when, we elevate it, when every elevator ride is solo and when our movements in the park are governed by circles painted on the grass and signs reminding us to imagine a six foot repellent field around our bodies. We walk on the sidewalk, meandering between curbside tables, perhaps celebrating the ingenuity of our threatened local restaurants but also wondering, as prompted by many Black urbanists and disability activists, how such appropriation of public space communicates who is welcome and who is not. And I realize Dietmar also raised this issue. We appreciate a new future when doctors diagnose our ailments not by pressing our bellies and listening to our hearts, but by deploying interactive surveys and interpreting visual cues on screens. And we feel deep down the fraught contradiction when in this age of predictive strategically deployed policing, officers still violate, maim, and kill through touch, the touch of their hands, their batons, and their bullets. We wonder about the proxemics of density that define our cities. And perhaps we can imagine new data-driven or generative planning software that can be responsibly supplemented with incidental ambient qualitative data and other ways of knowing to help us design cities that flatten the curves of inequity through practices and policies that prioritize justice and recognize that what counts exceeds what we can count. Thank you. The end. Thank you, Shannon.